I'll get it off. <laughs> welcome to worship at Celebration Community Church. We welcome those of you who are here in the sanctuary and those who are worshiping with us online. If you're in the sanctuary and this is your first time to worship with us, there's a yellow card in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that out, fill it out, and then there's a box at the back. And as you leave, you can uh, deposit it there. If you're at home, email us and let us know that you're worshiping with us. Yesterday was the Women's March. I was there, and there was a young man at the back of the crowd with a microphone in his Bible. He was yelling at us, and I wondered as he yelled, if you want to know Jesus, come talk to me. I wondered, will anybody be drawn to the love of Jesus? I just wondered. We will have the gathering this week. It will be on Zoom. We will be continuing with our discussion of the book, um, what the Bible really says about homosexuality, and this week we're on chapter three. Every uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m., you can tell this is driving me crazy. Every Tuesday at 7 p.m., we'll have a, we have an AA acceptance group in Fellowship Hall, and um, everyone is welcome to that group. Our monthly board meeting was rescheduled to this Tuesday at six o'clock. It is six o'clock. Right? Six o'clock. Um, and if you are unable to attend the service for Gay Troutman, but you would like to watch the recording of the service, you can email Shannon and she will send you the link. It's a private email, I mean YouTube, uh, and just not anybody can go there, so you will need the link. You will be able to buy a black tie raffle ticket after worship here in the fireside room. We're doing great with selling them. I hope uh, you'll continue offering one to your friends and family, offering it so they can buy one as well. Today we are again with Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, and I think he has some important words for us today. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Please join me in the call to worship as shown on the screen. Praise be to God who has called us together. We come here to seek you, heaven and hope. Open your hearts to God's redeeming love. Help us to hear your words, O Lord, and follow your praise. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we come to you today with so many things on our hearts. You call us to be in a relationship of trust and love with you, and you offer healing to us for those portions of our lives that are broken and injured. Help us to be open to your mercy and healing love, for we ask this in Jesus' name. I invite you to stand as we open in worship with our opening song. It is Tell Me the Stories of Jesus.
Psalm 26. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing a loud song of thanksgiving and telling of all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. I walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great congregation, I will bless the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. God of love, love that will not let us go, we rest our weary souls in you. This week, oh God, some of us have finally seen the color shimmering after the storm, and others of us are still longing for signs of hope. Loving God, hear our prayers for those who need the sound of your love spoken clearly into their weary souls. We pray for Becky Sneed, Bill Elliott, Bonnie Watkins, Debbie Brock, Di Sharp, Francie Hazelton, Glenda Gardner, Jeremy King and his family, J. Lonnie Stafford, <coughs> Linda Lipinski, Marla Morris, Melissa McClure, Pat and Elva Gallery, Rachel DeHoyas, Vicki Cooper, Bill Jemison, Gail Boyette and her family, Darlene Pettigo, Julie Pope, Daryl Whitten, Don Maunder, Joni Bolton, Julie Minchie, and Pat Stafford. God of love, there are too many days when our attention settles on ourselves instead of focusing on your invitation to love others. May our response to your love be love. With our whole hearts, let us spend our love with abandon and risk our love with no thought of our own gain so that our neighbors will know your caring love. The hurting will know your healing love and those who we say we love will know that it is true. In the name of Jesus, who came to show us your love, we pray. Amen. Please rise as you are able for a reading from the Gospel of Mark. 
some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and a mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, and laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. This is a gospel of grace. Thank you, John. Craddock said, what'd you get? 
And the man replied, well, I found this old box in there between an old wash basin and a churn. I got all the contents of this box for one dollar. Well, what's in it, Craddock asked. The man opened it up, and it was a box full of words. A box full of words burned or notched in wood, and he pulled one of them out, and it said, Till death do us part. He pulled out another, and it said, I give you my word. Well, what are you going to do with that, Craddock asked. And the man said, well, the reason the owner let me have it for a dollar is nobody talks like that anymore. These words are useless. And some would tell us that marriage, where we hear those very words, is passe and useless. But not to our community here at Celebration, where so many of you fought long and hard for your life to get married. According to Jesus, there is always a place for this covenantal relationship between two people who love each other. Now, does this mean that they will always agree, that they'll never have any conflict about any issues? Certainly not. But seen in today's world, a couple can be unified in spirit, in friendship, and in living. They can make a stubborn, unwavering commitment to each other. The expansive family ethic that Jesus teaches in our text for today is inclusive, and it's characterized by love and mutuality. So Jesus is in Judea on his way to Jerusalem. Large crowds are coming to hear him. And both the Pharisees and Jesus are aware that this is John the Baptist's old stomping ground. John had recently been in prison, and if you remember, we talked about this not too long ago. He was put to death as a result of his speaking out about Herod Antipas' illegitimate marriage to his brother's wife while he was still married to his brother. Speaking the truth to power can get one in trouble. But the Pharisees ask a question. It's actually one they know the answer to. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Well, now they're probably hoping to trap Jesus into saying something that will get him in trouble too. Because the question about divorce was a topic around which there were strong emotions. The Pharisees often argued over what were legitimate grounds for divorce. They had two schools of thought, each with a rabbi who had a unique opinion on marriage and divorce. The school of Shammai taught that the only basis for divorce was adultery. The school of Hillel was much more lenient in its interpretation of Jewish law, and husbands could use almost any excuse to get rid of their wives, even if they burned the roast on Sunday. So Jesus answers them with the question, what did Moses command you? And they answer, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. To us, if we'd been standing there, we would have thought this is a no-win situation. But Jesus turns it around and teaches them not about the grounds for divorce, but rather Jesus teaches them about marriage. What marriage is supposed to be that is an important topic for the LGBTQ plus community. The laws of marriage changed a mere six years ago. So it is important to focus on Jesus' words about marriage. In Jesus' day, men were in control of most everything. Women were simply property. If a husband divorced his wife, the woman was often left with nothing and became homeless. Some women were forced to prostitute themselves in order to have food for themselves and their children. So Jesus wants us to move beyond a legalistic approach to divorce. But we're kind of like the disciples. Sometimes we just don't get it, right? And when they go into the house along with Jesus, they ask him again about divorce. And Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. 
And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now, it's easy to focus on the wrong words here. Because Jesus is shake, shaking up the culture of the day by suggesting that a woman could divorce her husband. It's a new and revolutionary idea. There are some <clears throat> that have wanted to use this text to answer questions it really doesn't address. Some would say that these verses prove the argument against same-sex marriage because Jesus says marriage is between a man and a woman. Now, why would we think that Jesus would say anything about same-sex marriage since there was no such thing in his day? That would be kind of like expecting Thomas Edison to talk about LED lights when he invented the light bulb way back in 1879. LED lights weren't even thought of at that moment. When we try to make this about marriage between two men or two women, we've lost our focus on the point of Jesus' teaching. He is reframing for them and for us what it means to be married, no matter who you marry. If we're honest, we must admit that we often pick and choose which parts of the Bible to believe. We thankfully no longer believe that Jesus is telling us to exclude divorced people from the community of faith. Because we've come to accept the fact that sometimes divorce is the most healthy option. Now some want to make this about the subservience of women. That preacher I told you about yesterday, I don't know who's a preacher, but the man standing on the corner yelling at us. Well, the last thing he said as we finished the march was women belong in the home. You know, might know how that went over. <laughs> they take note that the people that want to make this about women take note that Jesus says a marriage is between a man and a woman and women are to be helpers to their husbands. The Hebrew word for helper primarily refers to God. And God's not subordinate to, to us as human beings. In the Hebrew Old Testament, the Hebrew word for helper, Azar, is used 21 times. And 17 of the 21 are reference to God. Marriage is to be a shared life as we stand by each other's side throughout the difficult times of life, and the times when all is well. We are to be equal partners, whether we are in a same-sex marriage or a marriage between a man and a woman. Jesus' ideal seems to be that there would be no divorce. But we all know that we live in a broken world where marriages are not always made in heaven. Not all problems can be worked out, and sometimes divorce is the best answer. Some couples find themselves in an abusive situation. Sometimes there's another person involved, and sometimes addictions can cause irreparable damage in a marriage. There are many reasons why divorce is sometimes the best answer for all concerned. Another problem for some marriages is that people also marry for very interesting reasons. I had a friend in California who worked for American Airlines, and she was from Boston. Her husband was a federal marshal, and she met him when federal marshals were assigned to some airports and flew on random flights. He was assigned to Boston's Logan Airport. She said that they would go out with a group of people who worked at the airport, and one day he told her he was being transferred to San Francisco. She said, well, we had fun dancing, and." We enjoyed each other, so we decided we should get married. <laughs> By the time I knew her, they had two children. And what held them together was those two children. They lived parallel lives. Sometimes we find ourselves more in love with the idea of love and marriage than the person to whom we're making a, co a commitment. Marriage can be fulfilling, it can bring joy to our lives, 
But we all know that divorce is not easy. There's often pain and tragedy associated with it. In Marin County, uh, California, where we live before moving to Texas, is the Judith Wallerstein Center for the Family in Transition. Dr. Wallerstein, the founder, conducted research and provided education and counseling for separated, divorced, and remarried families. She is known for her research focusing on the long-term effects of divorce on children. I knew several families who went to the Center for Counseling as they were going through divorce, and it was obvious that the help they received made the process go much more smoothly for each family member. All the family were helped with communication skills, how to be sure that the children were pawns in the parents' disagreements, how to be kind and model for the children, how to be caring and respectful even though divorced. Jesus teaches us that in the kingdom of God, there should be mutual respect and concern for each other. Jesus says the question is not what is permissible under the law, but what's possible in the new kingdom of peace, love, and justice. And so Jesus replies to the Pharisees, well, Moses wrote that commandment about divorce because of your hardness of heart. And hardness of heart is related to the resistance to the ways of God. He wants them to know what it means to have purity of heart and to focus on what the kingdom of God is to look like. Jesus wants them to understand the proper attitude of those who are to receive and enter into the kingdom. The proper attitude is reliance on God's grace and gratitude for God's grace. His words about the question of marriage and children and divorce is a positive word. Now, it does set a high standard, but that high standard is bathed in the mercy and the grace of God. Jesus always had concern for those who are the least valued, for those who are the most vulnerable, women and children. And Jesus offers a new way to look at things, and it drives the Pharisees crazy. Because he raises those at the bottom of society's ladder by suggesting they're the ones that are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus offers a new picture of marriage. It's to be a covenantal relationship of mutual love and respect. It is to be founded on a stubborn, unwavering commitment to each other. You see, we are created for relationship. And dependence on each other is at the heart of relationship. But so often we put ourselves first. And Jesus came to teach us a new way to live in relationship with God and with each other. In California, several of my friends described weddings they attended where the vows included the words, as long as love shall last. These words don't seem to fit for the kind of marriage that Jesus was picturing. Because marriage can be hard work, and it can be easy to give up on it. But Jesus is saying, don't give up on it quickly. Now, I've married many couples. Actually, most couples that I marry have lived together before they got married. And what they are telling me after they are married is that marriage has made a difference for them. It's difficult to describe, they say. And some of you had long-term relationships before 2015 when you could be married. And you too have told me that there's something different about the commitment you feel once you're married. Jesus describes marriage as a covenant between two people who seek the best for each other, who love unconditionally, respect each other, have a desire to give rather than to receive, and seek to never give up on each other. 
When we think about Jesus' views on divorce, which are indeed rigorous, we must remember that Jesus talks much more extensively about love and inclusivity. Jesus came to tell us that God wants the best for us. And Jesus always begins and ends with love and grace. If all we get from this text is a prohibition against divorce or that marriage is between one man and one woman, we miss the heart of Jesus' teaching about equality and inclusivity. Episcopal Bishop Michael Curry offered the homily at the marriage of Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. Some of you may remember that. And he talked about God's love, which is inclusive and characterized by mutuality. Here, here are some of his words. Love is not selfish and self-centered. Love can be sacrificial, and in doing so becomes redemptive. And that way of unselfish, sacrificial, redemptive love changes lives. And it can change the world. If you don't believe me, just, just stop and think or imagine. Think and imagine a world where love is the way. Imagine our homes and our families when love is the way. Imagine neighborhoods and communities where love is the way. When love is the way, there's plenty good room, plenty good room for all God's children because when love is the way, we will actually treat each other, well, we'll treat each other like a family. When love is the way, we know that God is the source of all, and we are brothers and sisters, children of God. And so, my brothers and sisters, that's a new heaven, a new earth, a new world, a new human family. May it be so, O oh God. May it be so. Amen. Amen. This is the time in the service when we give back to God those things that are really God's in the first place, right? But we offer to God ourselves all that we are and all that we have. This is the time that we would be bringing our offering to the altar, but there are envelopes there in the pew racks. Um, you can put your offering in the envelope and then put it in the box at the back as you I'd like to introduce you to this song. This is a song that I wrote. It's called Walls. Um, this song was written in Nashville uh, with a team of songwriters at a writing retreat um, that was run by Lauren Daigle's former publisher. And when I wrote this song, um, it was interesting. It was just an exercise. It was not intended to be what you're about to hear. <laughs> and um, the inspiration for it was coming from a place where um, my whole life I've 
uh, worked and been around a lot of people and had a lot of really good relationships. And I had some that um, began to be very harmful, as I'm sure you can imagine. And so I began to build up walls around myself in order to protect myself. But in doing that, I was missing the, the goodness of God and all the good things that he wanted me to have. And so um, in this song, I hope it can and reach inside your heart and touch you and that the Holy Spirit would speak to you. Uh, but this is Walls.
are here beside our friends and our family. This meal is set before us, and we are surrounded by your love. We give you thanks. Amen. So on that night, Jesus sat with his disciples, and he took the bread, and he blessed the bread. He broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body broken for you. When you eat, remember, it is the body of Christ, the bread of life. We eat together. And then Jesus took the cup. He blessed the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. When you eat the bread, when you drink the cup, remember, remember my blood. It is the blood of Christ, the cup of grace. We drink. God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your inclusive love that you offer to each of us. We thank you that you invite us to this table, that you give us this bread and this cup. Marcy came to uh, be with us at celebration and immediately, uh, not immediately, but almost immediately, <laughs> uh, as I say, had an encounter with the rattlesnake, didn't turn out well. And um, she has uh, really persevered through all that. She has kept on keeping on, and uh, we are so thankful for her ministry already among us. Um, I hear comments from you all the time about how much uh, you love the choir. The choir's sounding great. Marcy sounds great. And so we have a little gift that we want to give you and Mark. It's just a token of our already thanks and appreciation. And we thought it might come in handy. Thank you. <laughs> Make me cry. Thank you. <laughs>
warmth of this sanctuary, this sacred room filled with the memories of those who have gone before us. May the Spirit move and blow and fill you with strength and courage so that you will remember in the week to come there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can separate you from the love of God shown to us in the face of Jesus. Amen. Amen.